We're going to get started, everybody. Thanks for coming today. They should be live. Okay. Uh, today's topic, as you know, is uh, working in the fintech area. While you know this is a complex and interesting issue, it could take take a day or more to delve into all the issues. But we wanted to uh, to um, at least provide a starting point uh, and the perspectives of some lawyers who work in this area. And each of the, each of them today will identify the legal issues involved in fintech uh, based on their own experience. We have uh, four speakers today. Uh, Jenny Lee is a partner in our Washington, D.C. office. She's a partner in our trial group, and she focuses on financial services and consumer financial matters. As many of you know, uh, Jenny spent um, some years at the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau as an enforcement attorney. We also have Stuart Hemphill, who's a partner in the Minneapolis office in the Intellectual Property and Technology Group, uh, where he works on um, intellectual property, patent, trademark, copyright, and trade secret uh, rights issues. Kevin Mailer uh, is a Minneapolis-based partner. He's a member of the firm's technology commerce uh, practice group. He helps clients uh, with their technology assets. And uh, fourth is uh, Joe Liniak. Joe's a partner in our D.C. and Southern California offices. He's a partner in our finance and restructuring group, where he focuses on financial services regulatory matters. And without further ado, uh, here's the panel. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good afternoon, everyone who is out in the uh, ether land listening to us, and I hope this is coming across all right. Um, I'm going to try to set the stage for our other panelists who you know, we're dealing with FinTech, and we could go on for literally days about the issues, but we thought it may, may be better to talk a little bit about some basic concepts and how individual perspectives and expertise are applied to uh, to the fintech issue, whether you're representing a bank or whether you're representing uh, a fintech company itself. And in 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 my role, because of the fact uh, I'm an old grouch, I'm going to be kind of grouchy about this because I remember the old dot com issues and all of the nonsense that went on in terms of people arguing about. You know, dot com were taking over the world, and the answer was no, we really didn't. Uh, there are just a couple of numbers to think about, and again, as we're rolling around through these issues, think about things. Uh, as of end, the end of last year, there were supposedly about a thousand fintech companies with over a hundred billion dollars worth of valuations, in, uh, rather of capital, but theoretically nine hundred billion dollars of valuations in those companies, which seems kind of absurd. But that's what some of the reports have been. Um, according to the American banker, about 2% of fintech companies actually succeed. The rest of them fail. And that number varies between 2% and 5%. For an established company doing innovation, the number rises to about 16%. So there probably is some value of an old state company doing the work because they know what it is they're doing. Um, what we are clearly talking about here, though, is alternative facts. And alternative facts are not only in D.C., they're also in the fintech world, and we'll try to sort through some of those for you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what the concept of fintech is, and we're going to talk about the opportunities presented to the banks, but then also quickly the challenges to banks, to regulators, and to fintech companies themselves. Then my colleague is going to talk about their disciplines and how they apply them to fintech, fin, fintech legal issues. And then we're going to end up with the 400-pound gorilla, the fintech national bank charter that uh, OCC uh, head Curry has, uh, has indicated is, is high on his priority. Let's try to define the concept a little bit. It's a mushy buzzword that relates to electronic applications and systems used by financial intermediaries. And I guess you have to ask the question, is it a panacea? Is it 
an all-encompassing reading reason to avoid licensing obligations. And that's where I think is the case. Because when you talk to some of these yo-yos that have got these new applications, a lot of times it's payments, and a lot of times it's lending, but they don't have a national bank charter. They don't have a state bank charter. And what does that mean? That means they've got to have licenses to lend in all 50 state jurisdictions. If you're on the payment side, they've got to have money transmitters license in licenses in all 50 state jurisdictions. And many of these jurisdictions are now uh, taking the approach that you may be doing something in New York City, but if you are dealing with one of our residents in, say, Iowa or Minnesota or whatever, you, you need one of the licenses in our jurisdictions as well. And then you've got the overlay, depending upon what it is they're doing, of state law compliance and state law disclosures. And there's a lot of buzzwords that are bound here. Uh, there's the general notion of FinTech, uh, some of the things which we've got, you know, person-to-person uh, -person money transfers and online offline payment systems that are under development, person-to-person -person lending. Now, how has that worked out? Not very well. What people are doing right now is there, many of them are using the rent-a-charter alternative. And there's been a lot of problems with person-to-person -person lending, as you may, may be aware of. And then there's things such as authentication, security, and passwords, and verification when data is being transferred from one system to another. One of the things that has really come up recently is the, is the concept of not fintech, but regtech. And that's providing regulatory compliance within an application which verifies the compliance without needing additional human verification that compliance is, is available. Oftentimes, and again, one of the paradigms is using cloud-based systems, and under development, a progressive series of artificial, artificial intelligence, where the actual machines or the, um, the systems define themselves and learn as time goes on. Identifying the opportunity, what, what does, does a fintech application or product accomplish? Does it enhance the current delivery of an existing financial service? And there we're also, in particular, we're talking about the human food chain. I go into the bank, I use my card, in the back office it's looked at, it may be transferred to someone else, another bank may taking, be taking a look at my transfer, and along the way you've got a series of human beings that are touching the transaction. Well, does it eliminate all of those transactions without having to worry about human interference, or maybe one? What does it do? There's also the, um, the issue of uh, bots or chat robots, and some of you have had the um, occasion, I guess, of making a telephone call, whether it's to the utility company or whatever, and having them say, hello, please, push number one, push number two, push number three, and there's varying degrees of intelligence that's being built into these things with the ultimate idea of eventually creating something that is truly uh, artificially intelligent, can learn from its mistakes, and the ultimate paradigm is smart contracts. In particular categories where once a contract is signed, you really do not need any more human intervention in order for the contract to succeed, in order to, for the process to work, in order for transfers and funds and security to be working through the system. And again, one of the paradigms that people are looking at. For the purposes of banks, certainly the most important thing that people need to think about are full-time employees. Is there something that can be put in place that are going to make the bank more profitable, eliminate the need for full-time employees, and at the same time give us verification? Um, and also doesn't provide us with any additional cost, cost advantages. So, for, an, for example, if you've got a verification that works, and by, by the fact that the application itself verifies compliance, does that mean in a relationship with another party, a counterparty, you're relieved of liability for, say, uh, representations and warranties and obligations. On the part of the banks, some of the reputational risks that, are con that we concern ourselves with, legacy systems. The reason why we have legacy systems is because they work. 
And if you don't have legacy systems, is a 1% error rate, rate good if you're substituting in a new, a new system? That's the reason why you've got Fiserv. That's the reason why you've John Henry. They may be clunky, but they continue to work. And the performance levels is very, very important. And that's one of the things that banks have got to concern themselves with. The economic viability of fi fintech companies, how do you control them? Where is their money coming from? And will they remain viable or will they go buy themselves a boat and paddle off into the sunset with your money? Vendor management, we're going to talk a little bit more about that extraordinarily difficult issue for banks to have to deal with when you're partnering with a fintech company intellectual property which Stuart is going to be talking about who owns the property privacy which Jenny is going to talk about and then the negotiation of uh, of, of contracts challenges um, this is absolutely stupid document that the Obama administration came out just before the um, the end of the administration the framework for fintech and it's got a bunch of uh, palpably idiotic little phrases about what it is we need to do when we're doing fintech. Um, keep the consumer in mind. Recognize potential technological bias. Build in cybersecurity, data security, privacy protections from the start. Continue and strength, strengthen cross-sector engagement. And, of course, world peace. These are the principles that the, that the Obama administration came up with before they were leaving the White House. And thankfully, I think that this was one of the first documents torn up by the Trump administration. From the bank regulator's perspective, and this is where we're getting back into banking, it's safety and soundness perspective, and that's really what counts. Now, one of the things interesting that I think we need to be aware of from the bank perspective is we've talked with the federal prudential regulators, and we've said, well, look, these new fintech companies, they cannot, they cannot comply the way we want them to comply. We, want them, we have to do vendor management, but they simply can't do it. And the answer from the regulator's perspective is, yes, we know that, but we're going to make sure that you, you, you force them to do it anyway, which is not a really good result, which means that somehow when banks are partnering with fintech companies, they realize that they may not be able to comply, but you're going to have to figure out a way to do it for them. A couple of position papers which are interesting, the CFPB's Project Catalyst, which theoretically gives new fintech companies some, uh, some room to be able to experiment, and the OCC's recommendations, which we'll get into a little bit later. And by the way, the OCC has been doing an excellent job in terms of dealing with fintech and developing products and services in the banking sectors. For the fintech companies, the issues are, will the uh, startup survive? Are they solutions looking for problems? And I think this is something which I think a lot of fintech companies are not necessarily focusing in on. Is the solution a viable solution for the banking sector? Developing standards in the marketplace. And a couple of things here, you've got R3, utility, settlement coin, global payment steering committee. They're setting up standards under blockchain, but in some cases people have decided to resign from these organizations because they're not really so much interested in the standards being developed as opposed to whether or not there's some innovation taking place. And there's definitely a tension there which we have to look at as to whether or not these things are going to be helpful. Compliance capabilities, again, a very, very big issue, which I believe that ultimately the banking industry is going to have to be doing, and intellectual property concerns, which, which Stuart is going to be talking about. And so there's a lot of things there that we have to sort through as we're, as we're doing, um, as we're representing banks, we're representing the fintech companies. Now, what we are going to do is that we're going to have three of our colleagues talk about um, fintech from their perspective and, and the disciplines that they come from, and then we'll turn around and talk about some of the things the OCC has in mind. So, Jenny, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Joe. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, just to elaborate a bit further, uh, Joe provided a very good overview of, about what exactly are we speaking about when we re refer to the term fintech. And in my world of consumer protection and CFPB uh, issues, um, some of the more common categories of businesses that would be encompassed by the word fintech are listed here on this slide. Uh, so we're talking about, as Joe had mentioned, peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, which is also called marketplace lending, companies out in Silicon Valley like uh, Lending Club or Prosper, uh, 
alternative payment systems, mobile payments, consumer lending, uh, including uh, some unique innovation going on in the student loan uh, space and education financing, uh, cash advance products, short-term small dollar loans, uh, blockchain, which is is not only the technology that undergirded Bitcoin, but is also, uh, as, as you know, a, a broader technology that has many promising applications in different areas, distributed ledger, virtual currencies, and personal finance management. And um, the different structures in which fintech companies could establish their business could include offering standalone consumer uh, credit products or partnering with with banks themselves. I think last week I just heard about a fintech company out in Silicon Valley that um, uh, secured a contract with one of the top 10 national banks to enable the financial institution to begin issuing consumer uh, personal loans through the use of the fintech company's uh, unique uh, underwriting algorithms that previously uh, did not exist. So partnering with existing financial institutions or um, also with community banks and credit unions, uh, connecting capital from institutional investors to individual borrowers, or uh, selling securities or investment opportunities to uh, financial institutions. The FSOC wrote an annual report in 2016 and noted uh, at, at multiple places throughout the report that financial innovation is an area that merits special attention from regulators who need to be vigilant to ensure that the new products do not blunt the effectiveness of existing regulations. This is a great quote because it dovetails nicely with one of the thesis statements that I'll have for this afternoon. The pace of innovation and advances in, in the pioneering fintech world is much faster than the pace at which regulators like the CFPB and other the prudential regulators in the states uh, are, are using to keep up to keep up to ensure uh, measured and accurate uh, scrutiny and oversight over these industries, and that'll be a theme that comes up. Um, and I think that this FSOC quote is telling because it it, it admits uh, to that reality. Um, a little bit. Of further background, I think it's important to note that fintech isn't just a uh, D.C. or Silicon Valley or New York City phenomenon. It is, of course, a global phenomenon. And uh, in one of the letters that the Senate Banking Committee had sent to uh, several of the bank regulators in the CFPB last year, it was suggested that perhaps there should be international coordination with uh, different governments and uh, the European Central Bank, the World Economic Forum, others to coordinate the regulation of fintech and developments in that industry. Uh, of course, uh, across the pond, the, the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK uh, also implemented a quote unquote regulatory sandbox, which is very similar to what Joe was talking about earlier, which is the CFPB project catalyst and its uh, accompanying endeavor, the no action letter procedures. These regulatory endeavors are intended to permit innovation to occur and for uh, different fintech companies to experiment with pioneering technologies uh, without um, immediately feeling the brunt of regulatory uh, scrutiny or penalties and to work collaboratively with regulators to try out different technologies for customers. The regulatory landscape is truly a hodgepodge. So there are, of course, the, the prudential bank regulators that examine and oversee financial institutions and, and potentially fintech companies. There's, of course, the CFPB, who can act pursuant to its Dodd-Frank authority. And there are also other federal agencies, such as the Department of Treasury, uh, FinCEN, which issues, of course, the money transmission licenses, as well as the New York uh, Department of Financial Services that uh, began to issue virtual currency licenses uh, recently. And here on, on this next slide is just a list of the various 
regulations that would be potentially applicable to uh, fintech companies and their businesses. The evolving landscape of government and legal uh, enforcement of, of fintech companies has been manifested uh, not only in agency guidance, but also through the courts. Uh, some of the more recent cases that have an implication for uh, fintech companies include the, the case of Madden versus Midland, which was a case that uh, came down in the Second Circuit, which called into question the funding structures that are used by many consumer marketplace lenders to establish exemptions from state usury laws. And the Treasury Department had issued a request for information to solicit comments a couple years back on uh, marketplace lending. In the state of California, the DBO also launched an inquiry into online programs uh, to assess the proper scope of its licensing authority as related to online businesses. And uh, of course, as, as Joe will um, get into more later on in this section, the OCC had published a white paper and uh, solicited public comment in, in connection with its proposal to issue uh, uh, FinTech charters. Um, actually, one regulatory development that's not on the slide is a CFPB request for information that was uh, published in uh, the fall of last year. The public comment period for that was closed today. As of this afternoon, there were 40 comments submitted, and this was a request for information regarding the uh, practices involving um, financial institutions and data aggregators and other uh, business entities in, in so far as how consumers should be given access to their information uh, in, in financial accounts and other accounts. There are a few additional um, court cases and uh, developments that are listed on the next slide that I'll allow everybody to review uh, at their leisure in the interest of time. Uh, and moving on now to privacy and security, um, just to give an overview that there, there truly are multiple governmental agencies that regulate privacy and security depending on the product at issue. Uh, the SEC, FINRA, the CFTC, National Futures Association, the DOJ, of course the FTC under its Section 5 authority, the CFPB, and also all of the state attorneys general. Um, the, the bank regulators certainly also impose expectations indirectly onto fintech companies. Uh, what we've seen are situations in the context of examinations where uh, Silicon Valley companies that are providing, uh, say, new consumer underwriting algorithms or scoring products or, say, data uh, identity theft protection products, that they, they themselves are not directly regulated by the bank prudential regulators but there's a constant pressure and appropriate pressure perhaps uh, whereby the financial institutions uh, that do business with these fintech companies are pushing down the regulatory expectations that they're hearing from examiners uh, onto their, their vendors and, and in particular areas like fair lending, which we'll, which we'll discuss in a little bit more detail. Um, so although there may not be direct legal authority as a practical business issue, what we see are that fintech companies are um, constantly called upon to ensure that their scores, procedures, practices, and uh, offerings are compliant with the consumer financial protection regulations. And then last of all, of course, the gramm leach Bliley Act, um, both in terms of the uh, annual notices that are required to be provided to consumers and also the gramm leach Bliley Safeguards Rule that establishes the protocols and policies for safe handling of consumer data. Those are also areas in which we see that fintech companies are uh, subject to regulation. In addition to uh, GLB, which I just talked about, um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act also contains provisions that govern how 
consumer information is used insofar as uh, situations where consumer reports are handled by uh, CRAs or uh, data furnishers. And then last but not least, uh, of course, the UDAP authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act or the UDAP app for UDAP plus abusive authority in the Dodd-Frank Act that the CFPB enforces are the particular legal standards by which fintech companies are feeling the, the pressures to comply. Uh, last year, last spring, March of 2016, we saw the first CFPB enforcement action involving data security. And as many of you saw, that was the consent order with the Dwala company, which is an online payments company. And what was particularly interesting about that case is that the alleged violation of that matter was not necessarily the substance of the data privacy policy at issue, but rather the, the, the manner in which the company was alleged to have described their data security policies to consumers. So it was just a vanilla classic um, UDAP deception sort of advertising substantiation case, which was you have marketed yourself to be a leading vanguard in protecting consumer information when in fact your policies uh, do not actually substantiate what you're telling consumers about your product. Uh, so that was the first foray that we saw in, in the CFPB delving into data security practices. And then last of all, I'll just touch upon the fair lending issue. Um, so here we're sitting today in, uh, in 2017, I think dating back to probably 2012, the regulators at the federal level have been talking about fair lending and fintech concerns forever. And it's an area that the regulators are still grappling with. And one of the ways in which this comes up is this tension between increased opportunity to underwrite uh, credit decisioning in a manner to expand access to credit. So, so for example, using alternative data sources like um, utility bills or cell phone bills, or even in some cases, social media. I will judge your credit worthiness based upon what your Facebook feed shows or your LinkedIn profile shows about who you are. These are sort of the innovations that were uh, a twinkle in the eye of various um, pioneering entrepreneurs in places like Asia, Europe, Silicon Valley beginning five to six years ago. And at that time, the CFPB and others were grappling with how um, disparate impact analyses under ECOA or FHA would apply to those sorts of technologies to the extent that there's a legal violation that emerges if there's a statistical practice or pattern that may demonstrate that certain subsets of consumers, minorities, or uh, other subclasses of consumers are treated differently based upon a certain characteristic. Um, the question was raised as to how these technologies that are intended to be consumer friendly that would expand access to credit would then run afoul of any fair lending or um, disparate impact uh, analyses based violations. And I think this is still an area that the CFPB is, is grappling with. And uh, that's, that's a brief overview. And I think that um, at this point, I'll turn it over now to my colleague Stuart. Thank you, Jenny. <clears throat> Intellectual property seems like sort of an outlier issue, but it's involved here. And I'll try to explain why. Um, I need to put up a slide here that has the basic list of what intellectual property is. And I think generally, uh, you've heard of all these kinds of intellectual property. It's useful to divide them, I think, into two large categories. The first three primarily touch on the technology, the software, the hardware, the, the magic that's done by the uh, uh, computer programmers primarily, data analysts. And then the last two are the marketing areas because, of course, when you have something that's exciting, 
uh, that you're doing new, you want to have a marketing program built around it too, and that's not the technology, but it can be important as well. When you talk about intellectual property and you talk about startups in particular, one of the most important things that you're trying to do is to figure out what the intellectual property is, which category it fits into, and what exactly within that category might be, be claimed for exclusive rights. Uh, you're also uh, talking about trying to figure out exactly who is the owner of the intellectual property that's involved. Uh, as in most fields, the people that innovate expect to be able to own and control what they innovate, but they can only do that if they have some kind of intellectual property that lets them have possession and control over the things that they have come up with. So you have this battle to try to identify that which is exclusive. If your company starts out with not a whole lot more than an idea and a bunch of really uh, clever people who can create the software, the question is then how do you get ownership of that? How do you get people to invest in you? And intellectual property often plays a, uh, a role there. So there's that expectation, expectation of owning and controlling for the purposes of ultimately monetizing the intellectual property uh, that people have. Uh, and there's the broad concept which uh, I think people believe less perhaps in the fintech area than in, in other sorts of technology that when you have that protection available, you encourage innovation, you encourage investment. And we'll see how that uh, has maybe not worked out in the world of patents in just a moment. Uh, for trademarks and other kinds of marketing intellectual properties, uh, it's important and things don't really function all that differently. But in terms of the other forms of intellectual property, which we'll now take a, a quick look at, what has happened in those areas, uh, there are some challenges and some changes caused by the fact that we're operating in the world of financial technology as opposed to machines that uh, make metal or, or chemicals that go together in some interesting way. So patents have been a, a big area where the world has evolved as far as fintech is concerned. Patents are interesting because they are probably the broadest and strongest form of intellectual property protection. If you can get them, they let you come close to controlling a fairly broad concept. And you get to stake out that area with your patent, if you get it granted, and you can sue people even if they have not copied. For the other forms of intellectual property protection, copyright, trade secrets, there has to be some sort of actual taking in some way. Or the patent, if you had created something that you can capture in a patent, then anybody who comes into the area that you've managed to claim is an infringer regardless of their intentions and regardless of where they copied. So it can be a very powerful form of protection. Now, patents in the financial world, uh, the business world, simply didn't exist throughout most of history. Uh, history being, of course, the, the, the modern times where we've had lots of business activity. Uh, the innovations that people did when they came up with new business ideas were not seen as technology. So people, by and large, didn't apply for patents, or if they did, the patent office would say, hey, okay, so you figured out some neat way to keep the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, waiters honest when they're handling the cash in your organization. Uh, that's not technology, so we're not going to give you protection on that. But all of that changed with a case called State Street in 1998, where the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit decided that, hey, there's innovations here. And I think that's because the bright ideas were being implemented in software now. They were being implemented in computers and computer programs. And so, hey, that looks like technology. You've got engineers working on this, not just people thinking up interesting ways to, to run their business. You've got people who are actually putting in technical intellectual labor on these things. So for a number of years, starting with the State Street case, uh, things began to open up. Uh, there weren't many court tests for these things, but the Patent Office started issuing patents in the financial technology area. But then there came a backlash because these patents that were issued were very broad, in part because the Patent Office didn't really know how to examine them and to shape their scope. 
and they had a hard time understanding these inventions in terms of what's an appropriate scope for the patent claims being granted. Then the patent trolls came along, these entities that owned patents, and they would go around and sue lots of people, including people in the financial services industry if they had something basic, let's say, on working with check images or something like that that everybody started to do. And so there was a fair amount of litigation. Then the next thing that came along sort of in parallel to that was the open source movement. And I don't know whether most of you are familiar with that, but basically it's a philosophy out in the world of writing software that says, hey, software will become better, more robust, it'll advance faster if we don't have exclusive rights, if we don't have patents, and we can't avoid copyright, so let's build these licenses that sort of use the leverage of copyright to make you want to make your software more available. You essentially give it away, you get acknowledgement and credit for having been the creator, but you don't really get to enforce it to keep other people out of the area that you've claimed with your copyright. So uh, that was both anti-copyright and anti-patent. Uh, so then what came along is a challenge in a couple of cases, the Bilski case, and the Alice case, 2010-2013, and the Supreme Court looked at these cases after they had had various results below, and they said, wait a second, we're not going to outlaw business methods completely, but we're going to look at these things and make sure that they are not just abstract ideas, because it's been the law in the patent area forever that you just can't claim a broad idea like a law of physics. You have to have some concrete implementation or use of that idea. So what has happened is that there's been a, an enormous fall off of the protectability of financial technology type inventions. There's still no complete ban, but so many things have been considered abstract ideas that the ratio is probably, I'd say, 50 to 1, 100 to 1 in terms of case outcomes in, in, at various levels of courts. Uh, for saying that you can protect the financial innovation uh, with a patent, and the patent office has gotten very strict. So it's hard to generalize what their rules is, and some people think they don't really have a good set of rules, but they are issuing patents only on inventions with a great deal of what's sometimes called technicity, high technical content. And the courts have, since the Bilski and Alice decisions, found patentability in a handful of cases for some financial inventions, but by and large, uh, it's very difficult to get a broadly claimed financial invention uh, protected. So an alternative form of protection that we need to think about is copyrights, because when the law of copyright was revised and modernized in 1976, it was decided that software would be included as a literary work, which to those of you who understand computer programming seems a bit far-fetched, but that's the way they thought about it. You got authors that write code, you got authors that write prose. Uh, we're gonna protect it all uh, under the copyright law. Now, the problem with copyright, it will protect you against, protect, it'll protect you against copying of your software directly or copying by sort of close paraphrase, such as translating into another language, but you can't really protect business methods with copyrights, you can't protect broad ideas, and you can't protect data or facts per se under copyright. Those are traditional copyright limitations. So copyright is there and it's important to protect software against direct copying, but it doesn't provide the kind of protection that patents can if you can get them. Trade secrets has become the other alternative, and there have been a couple of cases of theft of trade secrets in the financial world, um, I think a Goldman Sachs case, maybe a Merrill Lynch case, where people who worked at programming have been accused of, of taking trade secrets when they leave. Uh, they take their, their ideas for certain algorithms or ways of organizing data with them, and they get sued. So trade secrets can be a potent form of protection for both uh, software and for data. The other side of this that we have to think about, though, in terms of looking at the technology, we're not going to talk about the trademark side of things here, is you have to worry about the IP that other people have, because if you're in the financial technology world, you may not be the first one to think of it, so you need to worry about whether you are 
taking the trade secrets of some party because you've hired some engineer who worked for another company earlier. You, of course, have to worry about whether you might have copyright infringement if somebody has borrowed some code for somewhere. So you have to worry about the flip side of being able to claim your technology, which is running into somebody else's claim. There were lots of financial technology patents issues, as I said, uh, pre-Bilski. Uh, their enforcement is now very uncertain for the reasons that we talked about above, but you still have to worry about those. So let's talk about one more issue that is of special challenge for intellectual property in the intellectual property world, and that is owning it. When you're talking about owning hardware, if that happens to be part of your financial technology, maybe some kind of mobile platform or something, not too hard to figure out who the inventor is. Software, you can tell who the authors are, they're the people that wrote the code. When you're talking about data, and data can be extremely valuable, as you, as you all know, uh, who's the author? Is the party that collects the data from the various sources the, the author and the owner? Are the people providing the data the authors? It's difficult to do the analysis. And when you talk about AI, artificial intelligence, AI sometimes is the creator of new data. So who is the author of that? The computer program? The owners of the computer program? You get into some very interesting issues as to trying to figure out who really owns the, the intellectual property. Uh, the reason it's important is that most intellectual property is leveraged by licensing it, and if you don't know who owns it, it's a little bit hard to license, or if you find out that the intellectual property isn't protectable, of course, you don't have anything to license. So let me finish with one thing, which is the point that understanding the implications of technologies requires that you understand the technology, and that's where we all run into problems. I, I don't see many engineers here. Maybe there are some. Uh, this stuff is very complex. So to understand how it works, and blockchain is a good example, you really have to understand something about how the technology works. This is important to understand what the implications are in terms of what can be accomplished with the technology. It's also important for understanding the risks associated with the technology. And by risks, I think we need to think of two categories. What are the risks of sort of failure of the technology uh, that it, it, it just doesn't really do what it's supposed to do for security. There are also risks in terms of shifting the risks that exist in financial transactions, issues, I guess, surrounding the word trust. Can you trust this payment to work and so on? So uh, if any of you want to take a quick look at blockchain, you can either go home and look at this uh, short video, six minute video, or we can show it on the screen later if anybody's really interested to see a little sketch of what blockchain technology is. It gives you some inkling of what that technology might mean. So that's it for IP. Kevin's gonna talk a little bit on other issues uh, that relate to how you exploit um, technology and other things uh, in the FinTech world. All right, uh, so uh, my name is Kevin Mailer. I am a uh, partner in the corporate group and then uh, my practice is what we call technology commerce. And so in that practice, what we do is uh, work with our specialists to help either vendors or uh, customers uh, turn these ideas and inventions into a commercial application for the most part. So uh, we do work both with vendors and with, on the customer side, so we understand these issues uh, kind of from both perspectives. Uh, uh, but for this discussion, I thought we would focus a little more from the bank perspective, since for the most part, we have uh, bank counsel here. So when we're thinking about technology, banks face what I think of as a buy versus uh, lease kind of decision. Uh, the the uh, build it yourself uh, approach would be if you your development teams actually built it in house. If you did that, you'd probably never talk to me because it, there's not going to be an issue there. It's going to be something that happens all internally. We usually get involved when it's uh, a license of some sort that you're you're involved with. But I wanted to think through this process because the legal issues that you face uh, depend on which, which route you take. If you're gonna do the build-it-yourself approach, 
then uh, you've got some advantages to that. You control the process, you control the rollout of it. You're the one who makes the decisions about how much you're going to invest in the security of it. We've heard a lot already today about uh, data security and the importance of that. You get to own the IP. Uh, we can all struggle with what it means to own the data, uh, which we do think about a lot and don't have a great answer for. Um, you also control the, the branding. The disadvantages from the uh, customer side of this equation are the kind of ones you'd expect. It tends to be more expensive. Um, certainly the initial uh, outlay is probably going to be greater to um, build this thing in-house. And when I say build it in-house, of course, you're likely to hire uh, developers, sometimes outsourced. Uh, you're going to hire consulting firms. Uh, it tends to be a pretty big ticket item. Uh, you may also, because you're trying to uh, develop something that is new for you, uh, speed to market may be a challenge. Uh, it might be faster to go to a vendor who's already developed the solution, even if it's not perfect, if, if it's important to be in the market very fast. Um, anytime you're working in a larger organization, you've got many stakeholders. And so working through that process of um, uh, getting alignment among the different groups is uh, burdensome. You have uh, implementation risk. You always have implementation risk. Maybe a little greater if you're the one developing it because uh, you don't know how um, uh, you haven't done it before. <clears throat> you have operational risk, and you always have operational risk. But in this case, you've also assumed all the liability for the operational risk, whereas if you had a vendor uh, you potentially could be sharing or outsourcing that. <clears throat> um, so then the other side of the equation, your, uh, if your <clears throat> bank counsel, your, your business team may come to you with a out-of-the-box solution, as they like to say, never really is. But, uh, and so there are pros and cons to that as well. So if you're working with a vendor <clears throat> who's done this before, then you may well have a lower cash, and at least initial cash investment. Of course, they're trying to get you locked in with the lower in initial investment, but it's some kind of a per transaction fee that's going to be lucrative to them over the long over the longer term. Uh, if they are truly um, an experienced vendor, then your op your implementation risk is probably somewhat lower. Maybe your operational risk is lower as well, although. Uh, you'll have a hard time finding that in the contract, and we can, we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, you may well have uh, the ability to negotiate a predictable fee structure with the vendor that aligns with your own revenue um, goals and models, uh, so that's another advantage. You have the potential ability, as I said, to shift risk uh, to the vendor. Uh, the disadvantages uh, are <laughs> the ones that we've already kind of anticipated with our prior discussion. So certainly security compliance is a big, a big risk. Uh, vendors, even very sophisticated vendors, are trying to um, minimize their cost and their liability. So they want to do what's required, but not more than what's required. And frequently, uh, bank counsel wants what may be more than what's required because your customers expect it. Um, most of the vendors, if these are uh, software applications of some sort, uh, both the data and the application are hosted uh, by a third party, often Amazon Web Services, uh, but it could be another vendor. Uh, those add a layer of risk, partly not because they're not good vendors, but because they don't want to take any risk either and you've got this um, kind of supply chain problem where the vendor itself is going to end up absorbing risk because it can't push it down to Amazon. Amazon's not going to negotiate those terms. Um, <clears throat> you're going to have less control over the development roadmap, so what's important to you and your customers may not be what's important to the vendor. Um, you've got uh, operational performance questions, you know, many of these agreements either will have an SLA, a service level agreement, or they won't, and you'll try to get one imposed. If they offer a service level agreement, in our experience, they tend to be pretty um, 
soft and weak with minimal remedies, frequently sole remedies. So your only remedy for these operational failures are, are modest uh, service credits. Ownership of IP, as Stuart said, is uh, a big issue. Vendors are clearly trying to build something important to them, so they want to own as much of this as they can, um, and that might not be in the interest of the banks uh, that's using it. Uh, you have questions of vendor insolvency. How do you how do you address that? How do you get your arms around it? Uh, and uh, termination transition, a different and new issue that you wouldn't have if you built it yourself, but you have to think about what happens if the um, if you decide to go in a different direction, either for good or ill. How do you get out of this contract and into the next one? It is uh, not easy. Uh, as we've already alluded, the vendor contract that you're going to see that will land in your lap is not going to be the one you really want to sign if you're bank counsel. Uh, it's going to have uh, lots of disclaimers, very limited liability, uh, sharp caps on liability, uh, and if possible, those caps will cover indemnities as well. So even if you thought you got good indemnities, the, the cap itself is going to uh, limit the value of that. So as we think about kind of the risk profile for you and we're kind of analyzing the agreement, uh, we also start thinking about the uh, kinds of technology that's involved here. Uh, and each of these little components, we don't necessarily have to walk through all of them, are things that either raise the stakes or lower the stakes a bit. Uh, you know, if the technology is really transformative, um, that's interesting, that raises the stake a bit um, because you don't know that it's really going to work. If it's something that m many vendors do, uh, it's a good service, it's cheaper than what you can do in-house, maybe that's a little lower risk. I think that whenever something is customer-facing, the stakes go up, um, uh, but that's not to say that the back office stuff is without risk either. That frequently ends up being a customer-facing issue. Uh, the categories of data, I think, matter quite a bit as well. If, uh, if the vendor is going to have access to all of the rich customer data, then uh, stakes go up quite a bit. Um, the type of vendor also affects the way we think about the, the contract, um, and we've already alluded to kind of financial um, insolvency and, and finance. So you've got a lot of companies out there that are venture-backed, and they have a decent balance sheet right now, but their model is not yet um, self-sustaining by any means. So the burn is high, and they are uh, trying to get that first mover advantage, trying to get your bank on their platform, and then, uh, and then hopefully start making money before the cash goes out the door. Uh, and so for the bank, that's, uh, that's got a lot of risk to it. Frequently, not in, sometimes, the vendor also wants you to be the investor, so that adds to the complexity here, because if you're an investor as well as a big customer, you're, the way you think about your remedies against the vendor are going to be uh, different as well. Um, just a, a, another comment for counsel is that frequently the, the licensing model or the service provider model is an RFP-driven process that, depending on the way the organization works, may not involve um, the compliance and legal functions until late in the game. And so um, there's a lot of talk, there are a lot of promises made uh, in the kind of the sales process, but they're not finding their way into the agreement, and they won't unless you push really hard to get them into the agreement. Um, our experience is often the business people bring the agreement really late in the process after the commitment has been kind of made, it's hard to turn to the other vendor. And even though you could be a very large organization, your ability to negotiate some of these terms uh, gets tougher, um, which is, can be a surprise. Uh, so 
when you turn to looking at these agreements, uh, I want to be respectful for our, of our time, so I'm not going to go through all of these. You can see we're going to have lots of issues, and if you're looking at a five, short five-page agreement, small print, many of these things are not going to be addressed yet. The operational issues, the SLA, is, there, is data offshoring permitted? Uh, you'll frequently see some kind of squishy language that we won't host your data offshore or um, we won't access it offshore. But what they're trying to say is, yeah, we do actually have uh, people in India who are gonna use this data. So, um, but we don't wanna tell you that right away. Uh, the vendor subcontracting issue is one that we've already alluded to. This is very tough for the uh, vendors because most of these vendors themselves have a buy versus build analysis. Many of them are really kind of a face to a lot of vendors behind them. If you're trying to push vendor requirements onto your, to this vendor, they then have to push them on down and that's very tough for them. Uh, we've already mentioned some of the other big issues, but limitations on liability and caps on liability uh, really make your remedies for these various breaches, some of which can be quite expensive and damaging to your reputation, hard to get a, a meaningful uh, remedy from the uh, from there. Of course, if you're from the vendor perspective, um, you really need these kinds of caps because otherwise a single bad event can bankrupt you and, and that's, you know, that's their position. They, they can't be bankrupt by a single bad event. I'll pause there and turn it back over to you, Joe. Thank you. Um, only got a couple of moments and I want to talk a little bit about the FinTech charter that the National Bank, oh, the OCC <coughs> came out with. Uh, as you may know, um, uh, the Comptroller Curry, his term in, in office is coming up in April, and I think he needs some, uh, uh, be appointed to a few FinTech boards. So what he did was he came out with this absolutely lunatic proposal on the part of, uh, on the part of the OCC responding to the FinTech complaints that we don't want to comply with state law, we don't want to be a bank, but we want all the bank pow powers. And he came out with this proposal saying, well, borrowing perhaps from an uninsured national bank, which is a trust bank, we're going to think about maybe giving you a FinTech charter of, as a national bank, which gives you the preemption. Now, immediately the staff uh, decided to, um, to fight back and say, oh, fine, we'll give you a uh, FinTech charter, but you've got to have capital, liquidity, recovery, consumer protection, and limit, limit yourself to bank activities, kind of difficult to do because the fintech companies, they don't want to comply with anything. They simply want the charter so they can avoid um, state laws. And um, one of the things I would suggest to you is as of this date, this is now going on about four or five months, no one has applied for a fintech charter. And that's because they really can't get one with maybe one or two exceptions. If you are affiliated with a bank or a bank holding company, it probably makes sense because this way the bank can do the compliance in back of it and the FinTech activity can take place in a subsidiary. And maybe that works. But I would also say to you, the thing to take a look at when people start talking about the FinTech charter is it's hard to come up with a scenario where the FinTech National Bank does not begin to accept deposits, which then turns it into a internet bank, which destroys the entire purpose, and you, we know how those things turned out. So uh, it's, it's a very, very narrow concept. I will say that there are a couple of companies that probably could make use of this, but there's not that many of them. And then summing up, what we did is we gave you in the back a couple of examples of fintech companies where they really bring a potential value added to banks and give you a few examples of them. Some, some development, some blockchain, Fannie Mae, uh, Abaroon, who uh, is able to uh, potentially reduce the amount of red flags on um, AML by upwards of 50%, pretty remarkable stuff if they're, they get, make it past proof of concept and so forth. That gives a, a real running uh, colloquy as, as to what you need to look at in terms of FinTech 
Uh, we certainly appreciate your time, and the bar is open. Thanks for attending. <laughs>